I manage a band called the Allen Door Band, and this band has 18 members that are ready to go and hungry to perform and get on stage and do whatever the anybody tells them to. So you say yes to me, you're not adding one member, you're adding 18. I'd say, I'd say that covers a lot of ground. <laughs> I would. I'd say that does the trick. That'll do it. Yeah, that'll do it. Yeah, I'd say that'll do it. Yeah. I'd say that would do it. Yeah, um, yeah, that'll help a little. Look at Ben. He's going, yeah, that'll help a little. Jenny's going, yeah, okay, yeah, so let's call it a day. <laughs> Look at Jimmy. Jimmy's over there going, hmm, hmm, yeah, so we're done? <laughs> I like the cut of this guy's gym. <laughs> Sweet world, and welcome to the No Dunks Podcast. On the Athletic Network, it's Thursday, April 18th, 2024. I'm J.E. Skeets here in the Class of the Factory. Alongside me, as always, Tass Mellis. Hey, podcast listeners. This one's for you. Next to him, it's the bearded one, a top shot hot boy, Trey Kirby. Hey, yo. Hey, yo. And last but not least, making the magic happen, super producer JD. Hello. There he is, and here we are, live on YouTube. Hit the like button, subscribe. Podcast listeners, leave us a five-star rating and review. We appreciate it. Lots to get to. Got some news. We're going to do our Eastern Conference previews a little bit later. Looking at the 4-5, the 3-6, the 2-7 matchups. We'll break them down, make our predictions. But we start with last night's play-in games. Had another beauty on playback. That first one, how will it be remembered? The (laughs) Nick Batum game or the free chicken nugget run game? Because both of those are the stories coming out of this one. As Philly beats the Heat, get that number seven seed. They'll move on to take on the Knicks, and uh, obviously we'll have the Heat without Jimmy Butler taking on the Chicago Bulls for that final playing game. But yeah, you think it's the Batum game mm-hmm. or the uh, the mm. chicken promotion that turned the game? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If anything, I'm going to go this way. It's like a newborn baby. It's ugly, but it's kind of <laughs> cute at the same time. Okay. You know, it got cuter as the game went on, as the baby gets older, because it started yuck oh yeah very much so uh it was put it back in (laughs) yeah come on fresh out the womb yeah that can't be mine it's yeah it's like like a baby chicken as well i mean the chicken needs another a little bit more roasting um anyway i hated watching the beginning of this game it was it was it was it was odd to see joel and b not be himself he didn't want to get really involved get all that physical. He went to the free throw line for a tech foul and fell to his knees as he shot the free throw. There was some <laughs> strange stuff there, and he also fell when Bam Adebayo was defending him at one point, and it was Bam's second foul, and I thought that was really fitting and a, a turning point for the Heat because they started to go zone with mm-hmm. Bam on the bench. Eric Spolster said, all right, we, we got to go zone, and they were doing some really good vacuuming, some some good shrinkage uh, on Joel Embiid where everybody was playing really hard. They didn't have an offense going, but the guys who were playing extremely hard and Haywood Highsmith, Jaime Jaquez off the bench, DeLon Wright, mm-hmm. because they didn't have Duncan Robinson and Terry Rozier, that also uh, was a problem for their offense. But those guys started running, and that's when they were smacking the heck out of the Philadelphia 76ers until halftime. You know, After all those 11 turnovers uh, of the Sixers in the first half, the in the third quarter, it was chicken time. That's, right. <laughs> That's when things changed. Well, the crowd was booing them, and rightfully so. Right. Like, multiple times in yeah. the first half when they didn't know what to do against the zone. That first time they've ever seen it. No clue. It looked like a high school basketball team <laughs> having <laughs> never played against the zone before. And it's like, what do we do? And yeah, Embiid, gas. Embiid looked tired a minute into this game. Yeah. And they just sort of moved the ball around the perimeter, and Embiid would sort of put his hand up and maybe flash. A, no, not flash. Sort of mosey to the free throw line in the middle, but they couldn't get it into him. Nobody yeah. could make a post-entry pass. Like, a lot of those turnovers from Philly were coming against the zone. And then that's how sort of Miami was scoring. Um, but, it. yeah, nice. then then we get Caleb Martin missing two free throws, <laughs> bricking for chicken. The crowd erupts. They're finally happy. They're getting a five-piece from Chick-fil-A. 
And, you know, that sort of got some, like, life into the building, and, and Philly, uh, you know, ran with it a little bit and made it a game and obviously on, went on to win this thing. But Batum hit a three right after. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> great stuff by the Sixers game ops putting this promotion in the third quarter. You usually only see it in fourth quarters. That's a good if point. If they had to wait that long, I don't know if people uh, are still <laughs> on board or if they're going to be booing Philly so much. So I don't know if it's the chicken game or the Batum game because they happened, like, one in the same. It's true. <laughs> like, the misses straight into Batum hitting a shot. That was great stuff. Are you uh, saying what came first, the chicken or the egg? But what came <laughs> first, the chicken or the Batum? <laughs> Holy shit. My mind is blown. The chicken or the oof. <laughs> <laughs> Batum, though, man. That guy, he's, he's making it the Batum trade. It's not the James Harden trade anymore. This guy completely saved the season, I thought, for Philadelphia. The way he was making quick decisions when he got the ball. He shot it right away. Yeah. Like the release was so, so quick. I thought Maxie also did a lot better job in the second half getting downhill. Cause in the first half it was like, okay, we're trying to get the ball to the nail. And that's the only idea they had. Yeah. So we're going to pass it around the outside until Embiid gets open and he never got open. Yeah. And they couldn't just throw it over the top to him. So in the second half, I imagine Nick Nurse at halftime said, there's other things we can do. Drive the ball, <laughs> set a screen, mm -hmm. pass it. <laughs> and it worked. Uh, Maxi was so much better playing in the lane. It made it so that there was more space outside. The ball was moving. Buddy Heald played a really solid role, I thought, in yep. this one. And then Batum with the little plays that he made as well. In the fourth quarter, he had that flying tip in where he kind of like reversed it in. That was really nice. He pressured Tyler Hero into a backcourt violation off a screen and then eventually blocked Tyler Hero's yep. jumper as well. Apparently, they showed him a play on an iPad during uh, during the break. They're like, this is what they're going to do. They did it, and he blocked the shot. Good scouting from the Philadelphia um, coaching staff. I think that was a Kyle Newbeck story. Uh, but oh, nice. Great stuff uh, from the role players from Philadelphia. And then Embiid, he was slow. He didn't have a great game, but I thought he was clutch. In the last two minutes and 30 seconds, hit the big three, yep. had the and one, then the nice dish to Ubre underneath for an and one as well. Yeah. yeah. 11 but points in that fourth quarter for him. Yeah, he obviously was feeling better and, and just more of a, hey, I got to do something and not just the hands on his knees that he had a lot of this game. There were so many possessions where he just literally just checked in and then had his hands on his knees. He obviously did not feel good. I really wonder what he said to Tyrese Maxey after the game because he was he was in his ear and Maxey was kind of like, what are you saying? I, I, well, I, it was we need a John Boy Media <laughs> a lip read of that because that was, hey, Maxey, we need you more because he had a quiet game. And obviously, Batub was monstrous with 20 points. Obviously, healed, really driving the ball. They needed some drivers. Sometimes they wouldn't even pass it around the perimeter. I mean, it was really just a... We're just going to stand here and, and look at you, MB. Yeah, and that, yeah. and uh, Kevin Love came off the bench to help out there. The Heat needed a bunch of guys to help out. They got those, uh, and so did the Sixers because they needed those desperately. Batum, season-high 20 points here in the play-in game. Hit six three-pointers, five boards as well, including the one you said, TK, with like four minutes to go, that offensive rebound tip where he's reaching back. They were down three at that point, so those were huge points from him. The last time Batum had at least 20 points in a playoff game, 2016. It's an eight-year gap between 20-point games in the postseason here. Apparently, that's the fifth largest in NBA history by way of Nate Duncan crunching the numbers there. So, yeah, unbelievable game. And Bede said it. They did save us this game. They got us into the seventh seed here and not having to play again. Batum and Heald is who he was specifically talking about because of the shot making and just like the just some energy because Embiid yeah you look at the box score he still had 23-15 he had the the big assist to Kelly Oubre Jr. couple timely threes but otherwise I mean that first half we were talking about it when we were on playback there's like what did he do he drove once felt like that's sort of all he did outside of like grifting for some free throws he had one take where it was like oh there there's a little a little pop a little energy a little burst otherwise it was a lot of nothing and and that was with Bam in foul trouble, too. And that's maybe, like you said, a blessing in disguise with Spo going to the, to the zone a whole lot. Yeah, that's, that's when the heat really woke up because obviously Jimmy did not have his thing going. Their offense was lacking. And at the end of the game, they went to Tyler Hero, who was lacking himself and having a bad shooting night, but it was going through him every single possession at the end of this game. Every single possession, it was a pick and roll, him and Bam, and Jimmy's standing in the corner because he was not feeling right physically. We'll get to that injury. Uh, but they had guys, you know, working hard and helping out. But they obviously missed Terry Rozier in this one. Yeah. yeah. Um, they desperately needed his offense. They chose him over Kyle Lowry. A lot of good memes about Kyle Lowry going into the tunnel yelling, 
Terry Rosier over me. <laughs> uh, good, good meme from too much hoops. The Brad. Jimmy Butler, Tobias Harris. Exactly, callback. exactly. Because Kyle was also awesome in this game. He didn't have to yeah, score a lot, but he was just he was just throwing his body around, <laughs> getting a, a huge steal with a couple minutes left in this game where he tipped it uh, from behind. He was key. He was key to just throwing his body around, trying to draw you know Chris Paul like fouls. But it helped because they needed anything. They needed everything. Yeah. So Butler goes down in this game, I guess, uh, near the end of the first quarter, right, on that fast break sort of where he pump faked and then sort of fell down and maybe his leg got torqued there with, uh, I think it was Kelly Oubre Jr. falling on him. He goes to the bench and he he guts it out. I mean, he plays 40 minutes, but 19 points, you said, Tass, you know, 5 of 18 really struggled. Many plays where he was sort of just not doing anything. He even said, I wonder if I hurt the team more than I help them by gutting it out um he's getting the mri we're going to learn today but it's sounding like he's going to be out multiple weeks so he will not be playing in this game on friday night against the bulls and if if miami pulls it off and even goes on and takes on the celtics he may not be playing in a couple of those games as well um and it and it turned the game because you know he wasn't like cooking but he was coming up with steal after steal a lot of steals and you know they were scoring a little bit in transition there and then once jimmy was sort of taken out of this game he was in the game but not the uh, you know playoff jimmy that we know it, it definitely helped the uh, sixers chances to pull this off yeah he just wanted to shoot jump shots pretty yeah. much after the injury but that's the dangers of grifting he had an open layup yeah. but he wanted to get the foul from kelly Oubre jr and unfortunately Oubre <laughs> bit on the pump fake and fell on jimmy's leg and now that puts the heat in danger of losing to the bulls uh, in the what a seven nine matchup or eight, eight nine, nine matchup yeah. uh, i suppose i think if you're giving credit to Embiid, you gotta at least admit that he did get bam into foul trouble and he still outplayed bam bam hardly did anything in this game he wasn't aggressive looking for his shot with butler struggling and with hero kind of just chucking i mean they didn't really have much of another option outside of a hero to do something with the ball because bam just couldn't get into his offense at all and wasn't very aggressive looking for it so yeah maybe Embiid didn't have the greatest numbers but he was forcing Bam to guard him and took yep. him out of the game on the defensive end as well. No, yeah. for sure. When you look at it, I mean, you can make the case that Kevin Love had a better game than Bam out of bio and what he contributed. We didn't say Bam's name a whole lot on that playback last night outside of the foul trouble. No, no. <laughs> he. It was odd that he didn't take as many shots as he could have uh, because there were a couple mid-range turnaround shots where Bam looked, whoa, this is a, a, a great development in his game that he didn't have early on in his career. But yet yeah, to see him not score a lot, not shoot a lot, was odd. That was odd. He took a three real early in the game, which he has been doing and hitting with some consistency, you know, an above-the-break three, but he bricked it, if I remember correctly, that first one. Sort of set the tone for his night there. He was he was off. Five and nine, only nine shot attempts for him. In a game where Jimmy is hurt, yeah, Hero's going to take a bunch of shots, but you said it, guys. There's not a lot of other offensive options here. Probably should be your guy that's like going to Paris on the, on the uh, Dream Team Part 3 here to have a little bit more impact on a game when he's going against a guy who's definitely limited, mm -hmm. at least conditioning-wise, in, in Embiid. But yeah, and that's why okay. Butler had six threes attempt as well. I mean, he was yep. likely shooting those because he wasn't feeling good and he got hit in the first half, and there's a reason why he wasn't shooting all that much. It wasn't part of the offense, obviously, because it stiffened up and he was grimacing the entire time. So, yes, he toughed it out. Uh, there is no doubt, but it was, it was a crappy ending for the Heat team who... They make the move for Terry Rozier. He's not playing in this game. Duncan Robinson, who was a big part of their rotation for a long time in this in this season, didn't play as well, which was Even surprising. They told us he was they good to go. Was, they yeah. told us the back was fine, yeah. and uh, he didn't play in this game. Maybe that was gamesmanship. Maybe that's just a, mm. to mess with Nick Nurse a little bit. But, yeah, Jimmy literally wasn't part of this team in the, in the second half, so that, that's strange because he is their heart. He's their soul, but... Uh, it was weird that Bam didn't take over as well. It, yeah. it was just a weird game. It very was weird. a very weird game. <laughs> very weird game, but in a weird way similar to the Pelicans-Lakers game that we did on Playback Night Before with a star player getting injured. I know it happened in different times in the game. Obviously a close game, runs here and there, uh, some guys stepping up. That's what's always fun yeah. about the playoffs, right, and these play-in games. It's like we talk nonstop about stars and all-stars and all-NBA guys, and then it's... Nick Batum going for 20. It's, you know, Alvarado in the other game, yeah. like having a great game, and, and Gabe Vincent, obviously, and stuff like that. Yeah. That's what I love about this. Highsmith, right. Hawkes, love. <laughs> the Heat's bench was good. Yeah, they were. <laughs> they, they were good. They needed all those guys. You're right. The injuries, too. Embiid not looking like himself. Brandon Ingram not looking like himself. Right. That, that was huge for the Pelicans. Some similarities. Yeah, there is. Uh, anything else on the Sixers? 
beating the Heat by one there. No? All right, let's get to it. This guy's <laughs> decked out in Bulls gear for good reason. Kobe White scoring a career high 42 points <laughs> as the Bulls roll past the Hawks. Sad caca. 131. 116. The most Kobe had ever scored was 37 points. And he goes for 42. 15 to 21 from the field. Nine boards, six assists. And this guy was electric last night there. What'd you think, TK? I think he missed four threes. So that means mm. he was unstoppable oh. inside. Attacking. And it seemed like it did not matter who was guarding Kobe White because they could not guard him. I think he made nine layups. And most of them were pretty tricky. Yeah. Finishing left-handed, finishing right hand on the left side. Uh finished one right right hand on the left side as well i mean he was doing all kinds of stuff that was impressive from kobe white had to be there though because it doesn't go down as his career high since it's in a play-in game but we all saw it he's got the stat sheet probably should frame it six assists to zero turnovers i thought was huge for him as well and the hawks did make it interesting in the second quarter but this one was over in the first quarter the bulls scored 40 points in the first quarter it ended with a dale and terry dunk you could tell that the hawks we're not going to be bringing a defensive intensity necessary to continue their season. I thought they were checked out. They basically punted the last game of the year. Then a guy that had been starting for them for a couple of weeks and beat Krejci, they didn't even bring him to this. They're like, we're good. We're done. And they completely seemed like they were done uh, with this team. So good of them to at least make it interesting in the third quarter. But this was a, a dominant game for the Bulls. Their season high in points was against the Hawks earlier this year, and then they scored, what, another 126 last night? 131. <laughs> yeah. Ridiculous. Mo- most teams playing the Hawks put up their uh, season best when it came to point total. <laughs> There's like five or six teams that did that this year. <laughs> a lot of like 150s sense. and 140s. But uh, yeah, Kobe White, man, the moves, the highlight package from this game alone, he, he was reminding me of like, Nightcrawler from X Men, because he like he's so shifty that it feels like he's like teleporting, like little puffs yeah. here and there as he moves, so herky jerky, uh, attacking any guy they had on him. It's amazing. So I don't know yeah. if there's like a, a Kobe Nightcrawler, Kobe White Crawler. I'm not sure. There's something like there. Yeah. Maybe we just call him Kurt. Wasn't that his real name, Nightcrawler? Um, he was awesome. <laughs> the teleportation of the dribble to me. He was uh, great. So so good. And this is a game they lose. Alex Caruso. In a very weird way. <laughs> a lot of weird Andrew Drummond, happening. that's his teammate, stepped on his foot and sort of like trucked him over as they're like coming back in transition. And it was bad to the point yeah. where Caruso, you know, is like, he's got the heat pack on his ankle there and they're trying to like get him, you know, back possibly in the game, but not a lot from this guy at that point. <laughs> and this is Drummond. <laughs> yeah. You got to watch out for Drummond no matter which team you're on. You never know what that guy. Yeah. yeah he literally just ran into him at yeah. midcourt. He didn't need to do that. He didn't need to dunk behind Torrey Craig earlier this year. There's some weird stuff that he does, that's for sure. But Kobe White, yeah, he looked good. It's a bit of a you know a big stage party for him. I'm sure a lot of people in the NBA don't know about him. I'm sure a lot of people in the NBA don't weren't watching this game either. I mean, you know, in a play in tournament You're game. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, he did perform really, really well. Yeah, the spin move. You're you're totally right about the shiftiness. Oh my it, God. it is really cool. And especially against this Hawks backcourt, it's going to work. Especially when they start <laughs> Bogdan Bogdanovich beside Trey Young and DeJounte Murray. Because they are a little bit injured, they are a little banged up, they would be. They would like to start Jalen Johnson instead. They would like to start Onyeka and Kongu, or get him involved, I should say. I mean, he probably wouldn't be starting in front of Clint Capella. But those three guys in, in Bogdan, Trey, and DeJounte were just bad. Um, and th- th- to end this first quarter, yes, Novit Krejci, he's on the two-way. They didn't bring him. They ended the first quarter with a Mo Gay, Wes Matthews, Bruno Fernando trio. And that's when the thing <laughs> turned. It was a 9-0 run for the Bulls to end that quarter be- with those three guys on there. I'm looking forward to Mo Gay next year. I think he could be a good player. But that combination of those three players was uh, was bad. And DeAndre Hunter was extremely bad. He played 40, oh. 42 minutes. Oh, he had two, two rebounds in this game. It's like he wasn't playing all that hard, not to mention you know, the shooting. Uh, he just was not capable in this one. Three of 16. That's said another guy on a long-term contract. Uh, uh, oh. it's, it's, it's it's puzzling. The Hawks have to do something this offseason instead of bringing back the same guys as they did last year. There has to be a big change. Some big problems there uh, with the Hawks team. Uh, yeah, they, they were fine offensively. DeJounte Murray brought them back in this game in the second quarter, but 131 points, it's no surprise. It's no surprise going from game A, where we saw a nice low-scoring game, 105-104, <laughs> to game B with 131 points for the Bulls. Not surprising. Really not no. all that surprising. And will this be the offseason where, yeah, the Hawks 
front office decides, okay, we have seen enough. Our two stars, unfortunately, do not work together. Because you have the eye test of that, and then the numbers back it up too. They got outscored by 6.3 points per 100 possessions with both Trey and DeJounte on the floor. That's from cleaning the glass. They had a positive net rating when either played without the other. So it was either Trey without DeJounte or DeJounte without (laughs) Trey. They were just better. Um, And so will this be the season where they try and either trade DeJounte again, or do you really lean into the idea of trading Trey Young, though his value might be at its lowest, I guess you could argue, close to it. I think they have to, though. They have to. And then you've got decisions about Capella and Okongwu because Okongwu's got an extension kicking in. Sadiq Bey is a a restricted free agent. There's a lot of decisions to make here, but they can't do this. I mean, this. No. I mean, they, and DeAndre Hunter, I mean, that's, I mean, I would cut him. Oh, my God. I, I, he's so frustrating. He is. He is so frustrating. He's a Ferris wheel him. that never goes up. Exactly. Yeah. A broken Ferris yeah. wheel, yeah. Um, and gets three quarters of the layup, then somehow you're back down again. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> he's brutal. Uh, he is. But, man, it does feel like uh, this is the end for this iteration of the Hawks. I think kind of indicative at the end of the first half, you saw how upset DeJounte Murray was with Trey Young because Trey may have played the worst two-for-one you've ever seen in the NBA. The Hawks score pretty quickly. There's like 38 seconds left. They get the ball to Kobe White at half court, and Trey tries to tap it out from behind, yeah. ends up a wide-open corner three yeah. that they knock down, and then Trey gets the ball, brings it up the court, dribbles forever, whips a behind-the-back pass to Murray that's nowhere near close. He has to lunge out of the way to grab it, and then suddenly it's a triple team on DeJounte Murray. The Hawks don't get a shot up, and then you saw like stomp off the court looking at Trey Young yeah. saying, what are you doing? And honestly, what was Trey doing? He played a brutal game. He wanted to be back uh, after the hand injury, but he probably should have just stayed on the shelf, I think, they because did, he was brutal. They didn't win a game after he returned. I mean, not just him, but he didn't look good. And again, like, kudos, yeah, he's fighting through it. He took the thing off, didn't he? Yeah. Sort of like the protective part, because he was having such a bad game. Thought maybe right. it would get him going. It didn't all that much. He's a minus 27 in this game. Most of his points coming up the free throw line, hit a few threes, I guess, but... Yeah, there was some frustration, at least, uh, you know, showing showing from their two stars there. And it's not the first time, to be honest, either. Yeah, the backcourt is a problem. They they didn't have this this whole idea of defense from Dejounte Murray has not worked. Obviously, he hasn't been as good a defender as he was supposed to be, as as he was said to be when they made they the were, trade. They were a better defensive team without Trey, though, for that big stretch. They weren't amazing, but they were like average. On the season, they're garbage. They're yeah, twenty like seventh. They were. They were. Yeah. They were yeah, like I mean, they're, they're terrible. They can't play defense. Yeah. No, it's it's an entire team. Yeah. <laughs> they have to they have to change what their roster is. Period. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, like you saw, Io Desumu come off the bench and play awesome for the Bulls. In in that regard, like he was yeah. playing extremely hard and he Hawks was killer. Yeah, uh, he is a Hawks killer. <laughs> Big time. I think his career highs against the Hawks. He hit a game winner, and Trey Young averages like five turnovers a game, and he had another what six last night. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of guys. I mean, we gave a lot of love to Kobe White, who was phenomenal and deservedly so should, like, sort of lead the talk. But, yeah, DeRozan did his thing, you know, 10 and 19. Vucevic was fine, you know, 24 and 12. You're happy with that. He hit one three. <laughs> one <laughs> yeah, to six. Uh, you said Io, you know, Dylan Terry <laughs> coming out there and, and Green as well. So, yeah, they got a lot of contributions. Yeah, a lot of guys are going to look good when you play the Hawks, too, is the, the unfortunate truth. This team is just... I just can't believe. I mean, I got fooled. I thought they were going to be a better team this year because of the idea that maybe they would have a little bit better of a defense. A little bit. To go with, obviously, explosive offensive players still in Trey and DeJounte. And what they got from Jalen Johnson was great, but they're just still garbage. They're still one (laughs) of the worst teams defensively. Doesn't make a lot of sense when you sort of look at them. Outside of the Trey, yeah, he's small. He can get picked on. You know, he committed a little bit more to that end, but still doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. DeAndre Hunter is supposed to be that guy to be their small forward to kind of lock yeah. things up. DeJounte Murray is supposed to have that reputation of being guys. I said I would assume he came off the bench for the Bulls. Maybe I'm just having good dreams, I'm just, hopeful <laughs> dreams that he comes off the bench for the Atlanta Hawks or something. They need something to change. And look, the Hawks ownership has said, oh, we're saving money. They haven't gone to the luxury tax line two years in a row. They traded away John Collins. They're basically saying we're running this team back over and over and over again, but it has to change now, now, now. It has to be this season after saying we're just going to run the same thing back. Uh, but, yeah, tough stuff. With Jalen Johnson, could also make a ton of money in, in a, a potential extension here. Mm-hmm. There's big questions money-wise unless you start to move the DeAndre Hunters or one of Trey and DeJounte Murray. So what's the play? Trade Trey Young to the Spurs and just get all your picks back? 
for the DeJounte Murray. I think the Spurs are trading for <laughs> maybe Trey not. Young. Maybe I, not. Greg Popovich sent him home from a Team USA camp yeah. once upon a time. Yeah, that's true. that's true. I don't think that trade happens if Popovich is still coaching. Fair enough. Fair enough. What about uh, I saw Lakers, Lakers fans. I mean, the Lakers yeah. are allegedly going after Trey Young, but uh, if you watch that game, I saw Lakers fans were not <laughs> enthused about the idea of trading all of their future assets for Trey Young. We'll see. We got the whole off season to talk about the Hawks. Uh, let's get to some other news, unless you have anything else on your Chicago Bulls. Anyone we knew in attendance there? Uh, the not that I'm aware no, of. No. Not that I'm aware okay. of. Everybody I was seeing was texting from home. Okay, great. Mm-hmm. Anything else? Any other notes? All right, let's move to uh, some news because we have the Western Conference final play-in game on Friday night. And uh, we know that Pelicans forward Zion Williamson, he will not be in it. Ruled out of that elimination game against the Kings with the left hamstring strain. He's going to be reevaluated in like two weeks. So again, sort of similar to if the Heat can beat the Bulls and get in as the eight seed. Well, same thing with the Pelicans. If they do beat the Kings, they will be without Zion for a little bit here. I'm not sure if you have what to add to this, except it's like the worst timing ever. It is after he played the most games of his career this season, right. playing 70 games. He looked obviously spectacular i thought it was the best game of his career dropping 40 there that being said i'd rather the sacramento kings are that eighth seed <laughs> just just because they are the better team without zion and brandon ingram is not playing himself right and cj mccollum who knows what you get from him they are not as good a team as sacramento kings so selfishly as a basketball fan the one eight combo i'd rather see the kings in there just because they are far, the far better team so i hope that the kings are able to uh, finally beat the pelicans that, that <laughs> they're zero and five and i think one of them was without zion i think they got waxed actually hmm. in the one game without zion they're seven and five the pelicans are without zion this year so not brutal i don't know who those teams are i didn't go for a deep dive yeah, but, but but ingram is not the same guy right no, now so yeah. that's a problem definitely encouraging though if you are the kings because you're like we beat the warriors now this team is completely banged up. Yeah. Who cares if they beat us five times in the regular season? They can absolutely beat the Pelicans because I think with no Zion uh, playing for New Orleans, rim protection becomes less of an issue uh, for Sacramento. And then I think yeah. you, you look at the Lithuanian showdown, Sabonis and Jonas Valanciunas. <laughs> if Valanciunas gets into foul trouble, like there's nobody that can guard Sabonis yeah. on the Pelicans. Uh, so I think the three-point game is going to be pretty big time here because there are times when the Pelicans just cannot hit and the Kings catch fire. Now, they don't have Herder, they don't have Monk, two guys who are big three-point shooters for them, but we just saw Keegan Murray have an awesome game. So, terrible timing for the Pelicans, but Sacramento, for the way their season ended and the way things went after their third seed appearance last year, they got to be feeling good uh, for Friday. It's weird when you think back, and I think you brought this up after the injury to Zion there, we were talking about the Pelicans at some point this year. Like They were like a half game out of fourth place. And right. that's when Brandon Ingram hyperextended his, le- his, uh, his knee. Excuse me. So that, then they started to slide. And I think Alvarado had a like an oblique strain as well. And that he was out for a couple of games. Like, they just got hit by that injury bug. Right after we had talked about, like, wow, Pelicans, everybody's sort of healthy. Oh, yeah, this is a really good team when everybody's out there. And then that zaps them. And then that drops them. They're, otherwise, they're not even in that game. You know, really, they're not in that play-in situation, needing Zion to try and carry them across the the finish line against the Lakers. So just that domino effect of those injuries there, starting with Ingram, who doesn't look good at all. Right. I mean, hopefully he has a better game against the Kings on Friday night, but we will see. In other news, the NBA issued a lifetime ban to Raptors forward Jonte Porter on Wednesday for violating league gambling rules. Uh, the league's investigation found Porter guilty of, quote, disclosing confidential information to sports bettors limiting his own participation in one or more games for betting purposes and betting on NBA games. And I guess we have learned he was betting against the Raptors. He was saying the Raptors are going to lose. Now, that's a good bet this year, if we're being honest. But uh, Silver says, you're out of here. Lifetime ban. We had talked about this when the news broke. Obviously, the investigation was happening. We had those silver comments, sort of those cryptic comments coming out saying, I got all the power in the world. And we were thinking, "Eh, is he just teeing up here a lifetime man? And in the end, Jonte Porter gets it. You surprised at all? I do think it would be different if it was a more of a big time player. I I don't think it would necessarily been a lifetime ban, but you go through all the bets. Um, It makes sense. (laughs) He put in bets and won. He, he bet on the Raptors when he, or against the Raptors, I should say when he wasn't playing, Yes, he he needs to be not 
playing anymore. <laughs> I mean, I think I think that does make sense. But this is just the opening of the faucet here. I mean, sports gambling is legal. More people will be betting on it. It is going to happen. People will be addicted. I think there just needs to be more rules and regulations here on who participates. There needs to be an age restriction. I think the funding of accounts needs to come from cash or bank accounts rather than credit cards where people can just have a debt for the rest of their life. And this parlaying of prop bets is is an odd scenario to me. And that's what um, John T. Porter was involved in along with his betting friends. If you can parlay prop bets, you know that just means that people who have an in here to the players can make more money and can deceive things more. So I, I think the parlaying prop bets needs to go away. It just they need to be singular bets, and there needs to be you know far less money able to to bet on them. So there's all that, but Chante is just just the beginning. It feels like to me. This was an easy decision, I bet, for Adam Silver once they did the investigation and saw that he bet literally against the Raptors to lose. There was no way he was coming back from this, especially because, like Tass says, this is a guy that's barely established in the NBA. It's kind of, you know, weird to say, but almost the best case scenario for the NBA that the first time this happens is with a guy nobody's ever heard of. It's easy to ban him from the league. So not a surprise uh, that it happens. And we'll see how soon something like this happens again. Yeah, it's wild. I mean, he is now never going to play in the NBA again. Um, just to like put into context his sort of career, because a lot of people probably don't really know much about him, but he did overcome a lot of injury-related adversity when he was younger, right? This is a guy that missed his sophomore season after he tore both his ACL and his MCL in a scrimmage. Five months later, while rehabilitating, he tore the ACL again. So... You would think a lot, I mean, a lot of guys that's happened to, unfortunately, and probably that's it for their NBA career or their hopes of making the NBA. He stuck with it. He went undrafted in 2019, still tried to make it through the league, went the G League route. I guess he signed a a multi-year deal with the Grizzlies, but then bounced around the G League. And in December, he signed a two-way contract with the Raptors for about $415,000. And by all accounts, I know Michael Grange of Sportsnet was reporting this, he was playing well enough for the Raps to probably get another guaranteed contract for next season. That would have been around $2 million per year, if not a little bit more. So he threw all that away, a lot of money, uh, for violating the NBA's you know, policy here on gambling, which in what? In the end, he made, was it 20000 21965 Yeah, not not great there. You know, I would rather take the guaranteed 2 mil, maybe 2.1 mil of a guaranteed NBA yeah. contract than that, but, you know, he's was in this world, addicted to it, I assume. He was making a lot of bets. And then when things were getting a little too crazy, he's betting against his team. He's putting these prop bets or with betters on himself and taking himself out. Brutal. Yeah. I mean, honestly, stupid. Um, like, I mean, if you're stupid, it's just sad. It's just Somebody bet $80,000 on a Jonte Porter prop. Yeah. It's like a guaranteed red flag. Right, 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 yeah. right. Um, so he is gone. And have we heard from Michael Porter Jr., his brother? And have these been asked? I've heard him on podcasts. Yeah, <laughs> I've heard him on uh, some interesting podcast clips as well. But has he been asked about this yet? <laughs> Could it have any impact on him here in the Nuggets Lakers series? Probably not. I but feel like we brother. would have heard something. Yeah, 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 I know, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and the fact that he makes a lot more money than John T. Porter did, so you, people initially say, "Well, he doesn't need to gamble as much because they make so much money." But I think restricting how much people can actually gamble would also restrict or limit which people put more money into not only their bets but also their friends, <laughs> because that better that John T. Porter knew he put it eighty thousand dollars onto one of his props which would have won him $1.1 million because it was a parlay. The parlays are too much. Anyways, the bet was frozen, and it wasn't paid initially. But mm -hmm. yes, I'm reading uh, all John T. Porter's history, where he came from. It was fun to read, to be honest, in the past. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, when, when Blake Murphy wrote about it, it was a great read, how he overcame it. Michael Porter Jr. also had the back problems and helped his brother get through it. But then reading this, he bet at least 13 times on NBA games through a friend's account. He bet 54,000 on NBA games and won 21,000. He didn't bet on games he played, but he bet on the Raptors to lose. He disclosed confidential information about his health to a better before a March 20 game. Interesting stuff there. And and then the a better placing money on a parlay. 
Yes, yeah, it's, it's it's way way too involved. There's just way too many bets to be made, and so if he gives out information and you can bet that way, then that's the some something that has to be regulated, as Adam Silver did mention. Well, yeah, Silver, he doesn't care if you're betting on the NFL. He doesn't care if you're betting on all these other leagues. Just don't bet on the NBA. And specifically, if and I guess if you're gonna do it, don't be as stupid to get caught by betting on yourself and then removing yourself from games. I mean, that's the the insane part because. He's not the only NBA player, I'm going to go out on a limb, that has uh, bet on games in the NBA, maybe even themselves, through other bettors. They've just done it better up to this point. That's the truth. They haven't been caught um, like this uh, like this guy was, um, pretty blatantly. So we will uh, we'll see who's next, unfortunately. This is, this is a sad way to put it, because it will happen again here. All right, moving on to the Eastern Conference playoff previews. You asked for it, you got it. Toyota? No, Cleveland. The Cavs had a healthy lead heading into the fourth quarter of Game 82 versus Charlotte. But J.B. Bickerstaff cleared the bench. <laughs> they leaned into the L. Oh, they didn't want to have the number two seed. Oh, man, that might mean having to take on the Sixers of Heat. So maybe a little gamesmanship there to set up this series with Orlando. Cleveland and Orlando, they split their season series 2-2. They both won once on each other's court. It's been a minute since they played, though. Um, so here we go, 4-5. What's one thing you're watching for, Tass? Cleveland-Orlando series. This is a fun one because there are many things to look at here. But my first look is big picture. And that's Donovan Mitchell to me because, look, beginning of the season he was incredible. Most of the season. An All-NBA player. He was so good. They were 36-17 and 17 going into the All-Star break. And after the All-Star break, they went 12-17. and 17. It is it is strange. It's really two iterations of this team. And since the All-Star break, Donovan Mitchell has not been himself. He only played in 11 of those 29 games because of a knee and a nose. So who is this guy? How good is he? Is he going to, going to go back to his old self? And he did have a couple good games to end the season. He averaged 31 in those two games. So the Cavs can be optimistic. He did sit the final day, so... Like a lot of guys, they set that final day just so the Cavs could be in this spot. So is he ready? Because when he came to Cleveland, uh, he came off a bad playoff round with the Utah Jazz and then had a terrible round last year against the the New York Knicks. He was not himself. But prior to that, he was a monster. So I think these two consecutive playoffs where he hasn't been himself, uh, he's got something to play for here. Jalen Suggs is going to be guarding him. It's going to be fun when he takes that floor. But I think he does have... He's got a lot to play for, and hopefully he's healthy enough, and he's he used to look like a, he was awesome uh, in those years with the Jazz where he was so good. So that's what I'm watching. Mitchell versus Suggs, who is a very, very good defender. Could see some Jonathan Isaac, I guess, thrown on him as well. Put yeah. some length on him. How many uh, minutes we'll see from Isaac? Played a ton in that last game for Orlando. What are you watching for here, TK? Oh, uh, yeah. Which Mitchell we're getting, I think, is a huge question for Cleveland. I'm excited to see Paolo Boncaro playing in his first postseason here. Um, but I think the big thing to watch is the possession game, and I think Orlando absolutely has to win it. That comes down to offensive rebounding. We saw how great the Knicks were against Cleveland last year. Orlando is a good offensive rebounding team. They're seventh in offensive rebound rate this season, but the Cavs are seventh in defensive rebound rate mm-hmm. this season. We'll see how that plays out. More importantly, though, I think is Orlando needs to force turnovers, and they need to take care of the ball. Orlando's the best in the league at forcing turnovers, and Cleveland turns the ball over a fair amount. Um, but Orlando can get a little loose with it, too. So I think that Orlando needs to take care of the ball when they're on offense, and they need to force turnovers, get out and run um, against Cleveland, because Cleveland has a really great defense, especially in the half court. So I think an easy way for the Magic to generate offense is playing as fast as they possible can possibly can because when Cleveland's set up it's going to be an absolute struggle for Orlando yeah they've, uh, unless they've got a uh, Franz Wagner finally uh, finds his three-point shot and stuff like that not a lot of shooting from the perimeter and then when, like the flip side of that was when the Cavs were rolling that was when they like had a bunch of shooters out there and they were mm-hmm. letting it fly and hitting a ton of them uh who's an x-factor in this 4-5 matchup I went pretty generic here because watching the Cavs last year when they went against New York was 
horrible. Um, they just weren't themselves. It's sort of like the rebounding thing, which is a grit determination type of thing. They're both good rebounding teams, as you said. The Cavs are a great defensive rebounding team. They don't allow second-chance points, but the Magic can if they want because they're a good offensive rebounding team. So this is more of a, a fight issue to me. Which team are we going to see from the Cleveland Cavaliers? Because like Jared Allen said last year about playing the Knicks, the lights were a little too bright. Mm. Uh, this team just wasn't themselves. They didn't have it last year, so who are they going to be? Um, now they picked this team. They picked the Orlando Magic <laughs> to play. Basically, yeah. And so that could be some bulletin board for the Magic for sure. The Cavs also have the experience against this Orlando Magic team. I know it sounds weird to think about you know Jared Allen and Evan Mobley and Darius Garland as experienced guys, but they were there last year. And Don Mitchell has been there for a long time. And, you know, they brought some oldies in there, like guys who have experience in Max Struess, a little, you know, George Niang. They, they have a bunch of those guys, but the Magic have size, as we talked about. Like, they have monsters. So if if, if they don't feel like rebounding defensively, Magic are going to kill them. They have monsters on this team, and Wendell Carter, Bancaro, two Wagners, Agoga, and yeah. Jonathan Isaac. That's They just keep coming. Yeah. Waves of big guys. That's there. six guys that are 6'10 or bigger. So... Are you going to be trying? Are you going to be trying to be uh, the team that you can be? And they were for a long time. Are they going to have that groove back? They asked for this, so it'll be fun. Do you have an X factor from either team? Got to get a body on Mo Wagner. That guy's crazy on the <laughs> offensive boards. But for me, the X factor is Cole Anthony. Orlando's 6-4 and four when he scores 20 or more points. That's not that many. That's not that often. But they're also 13-5 and five when he has five or more assists. Need mm. some backcourt production. Yeah. I do believe Orlando does. So that's going to be Suggs forcing turnovers, hitting threes, doing what he can defensively against Mitchell and Garland. And then Cole Anthony, I think, needs just to have a heater of a series here for the Orlando Magic to be able to score enough to keep up with Cleveland. Because unfortunately, I think this was a solid tank job by the Cavs. <laughs> I think they made the right choice here. You think so? Yeah. Yes, yeah. they're going to smash this one. Okay, Ooh. interesting, interesting. Uh, well, let's get to predictions then. Why wait? Why don't you get us started? You're leaning towards the Cleveland Cavaliers. I'm leaning towards the Cleveland Cavaliers. They haven't been inspiring during the second half of the season. Orlando has definitely looked a lot better. But these two teams are very similar to each other. And definitely the Cavs have more experience and definitely more offensive firepower as well. So I think Orlando needs to limit Cleveland's three-pointers because Cleveland shoots them and Orlando doesn't. So Orlando kind of has to make it back at the free throw line, which they're pretty good at. They're good at drawing fouls with Franz and Paolo uh, especially, but I think that this is going to be a rude awakening for the Magic. I will take the Cavs in, I'm going to say six. I want to go five, but I think it's going to be Cavs in six because when you, when you say, uh, weird, man. When you say in five, it sounds more like a smash <laughs> it job. It feels like a smash job. Six feels like, okay, it's a, it's a series, but yeah. you're <laughs> leaning, of course, to the one team. Okay, so Cavs in six. Where yeah, are you going? They, as, as Trey said there at the end, the Cavs are a weird team. Uh, they they sometimes perform like they did when they were rolling, but sometimes I'm not sure about them. Mm-hmm. I do I do think their bigs play the the series of their careers, both Mobley and Jared Allen and Donovan Mitchell, whoever it's Jalen Suggs or Jonathan Isaac. He'll be able to overcome it because it's been a long time coming for him to have a good series like he did. Uh, in 21 and when he was in the bubble and then or, yeah 20 in the bubble and then 21 the year after that he was awesome so I just buy them is it a smashy five um, <laughs> I'll do it I'll do it I, I think that yeah they bought all in for this so hopefully it all comes to fruition here for them because yeah last year was really bad that was one of the most horrific series <laughs> to, to watch uh, the, the they got smashed yeah oh yeah yeah in yeah, five yeah, yeah the, 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 the Tibbs, Tibbs just put everybody on Donovan Mitchell out by the three point line to double them and they couldn't do anything they couldn't solve anything they looked like the play in game there with the, the yeah. 76ers not knowing what to do with the zone I got five give me five for the Cavs yeah why not wow yeah, I know. I'm going repeat of last year. I got Magic winning game one, just like the Knicks did. You went through it, TK. They're very similar in ways to what Tibbs and the Knicks did in theory to them last year. They could replicate that. They have an identity. I loved what I saw over the last little stretch there from the Magic. And anytime I tuned in to watch them game, I at least loved like, the, the joy, the little energy that they were playing with where the Cavs, I mean... Yeah, what was it? Twelve and seventeen down the stretch yep. here. They're they're the opposite of that. Um, I'm leaning towards the Magic. This is going to be some ugly games, I yes. assume. This is why it's going to be on NBA TV. Uh, but I think the Magic are going to 
come out victorious. I'm very excited about Paolo's first postseason here. Um, I think there'll be some rough games in there, but there's going to be some gems as well. I'm going Magic in six. So I'm going to swerve against you guys in this one, which is always nice to have a few of us on opposite sides. So I'm going Orlando uh, to replicate what the Knicks did to Cleveland last year. And then here we go with the Donovan Mitchell mm. trade rumors. <laughs> Fire them up, baby. All right, so Cavs and six, Cavs and five, Cavs, uh, Magic and six. Okay, next one. Two-quarter guy Schumann here. Five months ago, the Milwaukee Bucks and Indiana Pacers fought over which team got to keep the game ball. Now they'll <laughs> fight over a spot in the East semis. Good stuff, Shu. Uh, incredibly, this is the first playoff meeting between the two Central Division rivals in 24 years. That said... They've already played five times this season. <laughs> they already had a series this year. Indy took it 4-1. One of those wins coming in Vegas. All of those games a whole long time ago. And we know the whole Giannis factor here that will not be playing at least in game one on the weekend. What's one thing to watch? Game one, probably game two, and game three without Giannis. Some, somewhere, somewhere in that around. realm, it right. feels like. So there's going to be a lot on Damian Lillard's shoulders offensively for this team. And I wonder how Andrew Nemhart, who's going to get physical with him, and Aaron Neesmith, who will also get physical with him, are going to play uh, Damian Lillard. Because Damian Lillard has not been himself recently. His numbers have not been good. And with rules allowing defense to be more physical in the playoffs, allowing defense to be more physical, I wonder how Damian is going to play. He also has an injured groin. He missed practice this week. Um, and you could say, well, this team made the finals a few years ago with Brooke and Chris and Beverly, but those guys, uh, I say Brooke and Chris, and then Beverly is joined because they're all old. I mean, I, I'm, I'm pointing out the old guys here uh, because it's really on Dame. Um, I think a lot of this is on Dame. The Pacers are going to focus on him. So if he's huge uh, in, this, in this series, then that favors the Bucks. but I'm not sure how good he'll be considering what he's been recently. It's Dame time versus Halley hour, completely. <laughs> Who's tapping the wrist at the end of this series? Because you mentioned it, Dame has been struggling. 39% from the field, 28% from three, his last five games. But the wins the Bucks have during this season without Giannis, Dame went crazy. 37-13 yeah. against Toronto, 41-4 and four against the Clippers, 31-16 and 16 against the Suns, 29-9 and nine against Orlando. That Raptors team, they were still trying. So those are actually th four pretty solid wins uh, where – Dame was really performing well, but he's got to be able to throw it back. I think Halliburton is a question mark as well. 19 and 10 uh, in his last seven games, shooting 35% from three, which is great because he's only 30% from the three-point line since the All-Star break. He's kind of lost the step to the side three, which is his go-to move mm -hmm. that allows him to attack inside. So I think if the Bucs are going to win this, they've got to get Dame from Portland basically, because they got to hit some threes uh, in this series. Indiana allows the fewest per 100 possessions in the entire league. They just really take away three-pointers, and you can score inside easily. Right. But the Bucks, they're a three-point shooting team. They make the fifth most in the league. So Dame's going to have to get hot. We're going to have to see some Malik Beasley time, which is scary to put that guy out there defensively. But in some of these games, he's been scoring 30 alongside uh, Dame in those wins. Portis has to have a decent series, and maybe A.J. Green with his funky release, <laughs> knocks down some shots. The Bucks got to be able to hit from outside. Yeah, and you said, like, yeah, the Pacers give up a ton of points in the paint. Uh, well, they're going to be missing Giannis. The Bucks are a guy I think, leads the league in points in the paint. That's a whole lot usually from him. So who will be scoring in there if the Pacers do a good job of trying to take away the three-point from a lot of those shooters that you said? Uh, do you have an X factor in this 3-6 matchup? Well, you mentioned Bobby Portis. Um, Bobby, to me, has been able to come in when Giannis has been out of the rotation, and he's been awesome. He averaged 20 and 10 in the nine games Giannis didn't play this season. 20 and 10. He will be defending Pascal Siakam, who has not played in that five game series against the Milwaukee Bucks as a member of the Indiana Pacers because he came over late after that. He's new to this matchup. He had some good games against the Milwaukee Bucks. It has been a couple years since he did that with the Toronto Raptors. Um, but that was also against Giannis and Brook in a 4-5. So how Bobby Portis defends him at the 4 is going to interest me because Pascal could. He could be asked to do a lot with Halliburton's situation. He may not be himself. Pascal Siakam has won a ship. He has been a, a guy who can be a really good supporting player in the playoffs. So Pascal versus Bobby is going to be interesting for me because Bobby's just... 
he rips off the bandaid and goes at it, um, you know, both physically and offensively without Giannis out. So that's that's big. That's big for the Bucks. Um, and we'll see how Pascal can handle that. I think Brooke Lopez is a basically for the same reason. I think he's the X factor for Milwaukee and specifically getting Miles Turner into foul trouble. Because if you have to go into the Jalen Smith, Isaiah Jackson range, you're feeling good. Uh, if you're Milwaukee, even with Dame or even with Giannis out, I just flash back to Game Five against Atlanta. Giannis busts up his knee. Looks like he's done for. Looks like the Hawks are maybe getting into the NBA Finals. And Brook Lopez goes out, puts up 33.7 rebounds and four blocks. He dominated the Hawks inside that series. That was three years ago. I mean, that's mm. a lot. That's a lot of it's all these old guys on the Bucks. We're just like, do they still have a, a yes. game or two each within them to you know, veteranship go on? Yeah, mm-hmm. can they do it? Well, I think I think Brook Lopez can certainly score uh, on yeah. Miles Turner, but he has to. And then on the flip side of it, him playing, Portis playing, all of their guys are old. They got to get back in transition because the Pacers love to run. Oh yeah, and that is one of the weaknesses for the Bucks, and one of the things that Doc Rivers tried to address right away. They've definitely been better since he took over uh, for Adrian Griffin, but Milwaukee really struggles against teams that are more athletic, and the Pacers have an athleticism advantage in this one. Yeah, watch the number of fast break points from Indiana. If they hit 20, they're feeling good. 23-4 and four when Indiana hit 20 fast break points or more in a game, and you have illustrated before many times, TK, uh, the, the limitations of Milwaukee because of their age, because of their dedication to like maybe really hustling to get back. They've been killed on that before. Now Beverly's in the starting lineup here. You know Beverly's going to be a lot of time on Halliburton. You know he's going to be all up in him, trying to frustrate him. So he's huge, big X factor for Milwaukee. And can he like bring the uh, three point shot as well? At least keep them honest. Um, and the Pacers, they also have like their entire bench as an X factor because they're really good. They've been really good since the All Star break. A lot of these guys contributing. Some of those bigs, some of the wings. They have a lot of bodies. Rick Carlisle. I mean, I think a lot of people are going to be confident he's going to out coach Doc Rivers maybe here when you get into some X's and O's. Um, so that's got they got that going for them as well. Let's hear your picks. It's a tough one. I mean, it it's the here. honest factor for sure. Mm-hmm. It's the idea like how much stock are you putting into the regular season where the Pacers have had their number. But it's so long ago. Yeah. There's been changes. There's been a lot of changes. Yeah, but where are you going? Yeah. It's, it's tough. tough. <laughs> it I, is I tough. struggled with this one. I will say the Bucks do look very different with Patrick Patrick Beverly starting beside Damian Lillard, just in terms of an effort level, in terms of getting back against this really, really fast team. This team that likes to play extremely hard. It's going to be different. The Milwaukee Bucks will get back. I, I, but then the Pacers, yeah, they have the depth that TJ McConnell can be as pesky as Patrick Beverly in terms of backcourt guys. But I, I think considering the Milwaukee Bucks have home court advantage and they are a really, really good home court team, I think they win it. But a little respect to the Pacers. I'm taking the Bucks in seven. And mm-hmm. uh, that'll be a fun series. And, and I assume Yanis will be back at some point um, in this series. So he'll be back for the late games, uh, I imagine. Where are you going? I'm leaning towards what Tass is saying as well. So I think I. Bucks and seven <laughs> actually sounds pretty good, assuming Giannis comes back late. Um, but I, I don't know. This does It feels a bit like a coin flip, so I'll do Bucks and seven. I think this is the first one we've all agreed on. I'm also going Bucks and seven. <laughs> I, I'm glad that we don't have a ton that we've all had the exact same. It's, yeah, it's tough with the Giannis thing. It feels, it truly feels like it'll be Pacers in six if they can take care of that game six at home, or it will be Milwaukee winning on their home court. I don't know why it feels that way. I'll go with you guys. I will go Bucks and seven in uh, what could be a very rare seven game series in the Eastern Conference in the first round. Been a long time since we've had one, so hopefully it's entertaining. Let's hear from you guys out there when it comes to that series. All right, the final one we know in the Eastern Conference got locked in last night when the Sixers beat the Heat. It is the Knicks and the 76ers. It's the Tim Bontemps can sleep in his own bed series. <laughs> okay, the Knicks won the season series 3-1, uh, capitalizing on Joel Embiid's absence from three of those meetings. Uh, Knicks victories came by margins of 36, 14, and 27. So really good stuff. Not bad there. For the historians, this will be the 10th playoff meeting of these franchises. First since 1989. Knicks Sixers. What is that, Mark Jackson? <laughs> 89? That was around that time. Um, So 2-7, Knicks, Philly. One thing to watch, Tess. I wonder how the Sixers are going to defend Jalen Brunson, period. I I wonder what Nick Nick Nurse is going to do with that because the Sixers don't have a guy to guard him one-on-one. That's not going to happen. Lowry, Maxey, Heald, Oubre, Payne, not going to happen. 
Nick Nurse is going to throw a lot of doubles at him. We're going to see the 2019 finals all over again where they <laughs> threw guys at Steph Curry or something like that. Box and one. <laughs> yeah, but the Knicks, they take their time. They take the most shots at the end of shot clocks in the NBA in the final six seconds, as John Schumann pointed out. So they're going to wait. They're going to wait. They're going to wait. They're going to wait. And how do the Knicks respond to all these doubles? They're going to have cutter after cutter after cutter after cutter in Hart and DiVincenzo and OJ and Anobi. They do that really, really, really well. So I expect the Knicks to be cutting up the Sixers team. I'm not sure the Sixers can guard him at all. He's ready. He's he's definitely ready for a first round series. And uh, they don't really have those types of guys to guard him, I don't think. Oh, Nick loves the scheme. He does. Uh, have you forgotten just... about his schemes? <laughs> this guy's the king of the schemes. Yeah, that'll do. I think uh, Lowry and Batum will get most of the minutes on Brunson. They, they like the length of Batum, I think, and then Lowry just is the same person. So, like, he understands how to guard <laughs> yeah. Brunson. So. And he's going to, like, draw an offensive charge. Yep. He'll flop on one. Yeah, like, try it. I mean, tough to rattle a guy like Brunson. I mean, totally, is a totally, rock, yeah. But Lowry will give it a go. I think it kind of goes both ways because I'm yeah. interested to see what the Knicks do with Joel Embiid, and if Embiid is able to stay healthy throughout this <laughs> series, I think it's good for him that they have nine days to play their first four games. Plus, they're getting a little bit of rest here, having taken care of business in the play-in tournament. Um, so yeah, Hartenstein, I guess, is the main guy who's gonna get minutes on Embiid, but they'll try Mitchell Robinson. Precious Achua will go yeah. in there for a little bit. Yeah. I wouldn't even be surprised to see, like, the Romer-style style scheme where, like, OG Ananobi is actually guarding Joel Embiid, and then they have the big guy ready to help yeah. if necessary. So taking away Brunson, taking away Embiid is going to be the chess matcher. Yeah, on one hand, sucks for Embiid this matchup because of all the great defensive bigs from the Knicks. But on the other hand, they're playing a team, you said it, Tass, that play slow. It's a slow pace. I mean, it'd be another thing if they were playing the Pacers and, like, we'd be going, how the hell is Embiid going to play in this? Like, yeah, he might score, but, like, how's he going to keep up? We saw him last night. I mean, he might get better as we go here and the conditioning catches up. Um, but that's sort of good, I guess. Like, the, the way the Knicks play, they take their time. They're methodical. Um, so maybe that works in his favor. Do you have an X factor? I'll start with you on this one, Trey. Do you have an X factor in, in New York, Philly? Dante DiVincenzo, to me, is the X factor. I think he's probably going to be the main guy to guard Tyrese Maxey, which is a huge assignment from him. And then on the offensive end, his three-point shooting really changes things for New York. The fact that he's become a 40% three-point shooter who takes a ton is big time for them because basically they got roll guy and whoever their center is, whether it's Hartenstein or uh, Robinson, Jalen Brunson handles the ball, makes all the plays, does whatever is necessary at the end of the shot clock. Everybody else has to hit threes. Chief among them for me is DiVincenzo. I'm not sure how much to believe in Joel Embiid. The fact that he obviously didn't look good in the play in tournament also sat out the final game for the Philadelphia 76ers. A little puzzling to me because he said after the games that he did play in, I just am not right. And so, why not play in more games? Well, I guess because the injury is prominent. So, I'm looking at what Tyrese Maxey can do beside him. And if they're just going to get him going downhill over and over and over and over again, I imagine that's going to be Nick Nurse's move to have a bunch of dribble handoffs or a bunch of picks off the ball where he's just ready to get the ball up top and just go, go, go. He's going to be asked to do a lot. um, And he should be good. He should be good at that if they do that. But they have to really change their offense. They really have to do this. Stop looking at MB every single possession. Although, you know, he's, if he's on the floor, I can understand why he's going to be good, Uh, but they just have to set up Maxi to be good otherwise. And then he'll find shooters, which they obviously have plenty of. So, yeah, the offense, the offense and Nick Nurse's schemes, if the scheme man can do it. We'll see. The uh, excuse me, the Philadelphia 76ers, especially Embiid and, and everybody helping out with tips and stuff like that, they have to end possessions defensively on the glass because the Knicks are the best offensive rebounding team when you're looking at offensive rebound percentage. And most of those, it feels like it's two for a dollar, TK. They get the rebound. And then it's kicked out to one of their shooters who can step into it with rhythm. So that's huge. Like that means that B's got to be a monster there. And again, the Batums and the Kelly Oubre's and those guys got to help there out as well, either tipping it to their guards or just grabbing it. So I'll be watching that for sure. And and just the Embiid factor, just like, yeah, not a lot of confidence after seeing how he looked last night. But they'll play this weekend, and then, you know, you get into the rhythm of a playoff series where it's every two or three nights as uh, TK broke down. What'd you say? Four games over nine days. I think that's right. Jesus, when you say it like that, yeah. <laughs> I mean, no wonder the postseason takes two and a half months to play. The first round is 
epically long. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, 40 games in 40 nights. Yeah. Uh, so who do you have winning this series? What's your prediction, Nick Sixers? I think the Knicks are going to take care of business. I'm not buying into uh, what Embiid looks like. Even in that play-in game, I, I don't think the Heat guarded him well enough. I think they gave him too many opportunities. And I believe in Hartenstein. I believe in Mitchell Robinson and the Jericho Sims, if needed. So I'm taking the Knicks in five. I, I think they've got enough weapons offensively and enough defensively, too. Where are you going? I'm leaning Knicks as well. I can see Embiid having his best playoff series and really putting the team on his back if he's healthier than he's looked so far uh, in his return. But what, it's nine straight wins right now for Philadelphia? Isn't that yeah, right? Yeah, that's right. Coming to an end. They're going to lose game one. I'll take the Knicks in six. Knicks in six. I'm with TK on this one. I went back and forth between five or six. I'm going to go, like I said, Knicks in six. I think we're going to have some monster like Brunson games, of course. Why wouldn't we? The heater he's been on. I think Maxie's going to be uh, due for a mo- massive game or two as well, which is why I'm giving them a couple here to be uh, to go along with Embiid. I think he's going to have like a 40-point a game at one point in Madison Square Garden, and Brunson will have one or two in this series too. That could be fun, but I'm going New York. The way they've looked, I mean, what's their record when OG plays? I mean, <laughs> there's that whole thing too. Like, uh, who's your best player on the team? Okay, we'll just put OG on him or have him all eyes on him, and we'll just completely shut that off. I think they're 20-3 and three or something. When OG Ananobi's playing, it's it's an insane record, and the plus minus every time he's out there, it's positive. So, Nixon six from a couple of us. Nixon five says Tass Smellis. Let's hear from you, all three of the Eastern Conference series. You're letting us know in the stream team. Let us know in the comments. Tweet at us at No Dunks Inc. All right, before we go, tweet of the night. Mm, tweet of the night. Wow. Twitter. We'll say Twitter's been good the last couple nights. NBA Twitter, I think, gets better in the playoffs. It does. Yeah, it improves. Yeah. People get more intense. You hear J.J. Redick talking about it on the broadcast last night? I missed it. No. Or, uh, maybe that was two you... nights ago. J.J. Redick was brought up uh, being on NBA Twitter to Mike Breen and Doris Burke, and they're like, why are you on Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> it must have been last night then yeah yeah, yeah it was last night yeah, yeah, yeah it was in the first game <laughs> so they just don't they were like... talking about the, uh, JJ brought up that people on NBA Twitter don't like that Embiid foul baits Ooh. so every time he was drawing fouls on Bam out of bio they were like does NBA Twitter think that's foul baiting <laughs> <laughs> and Breen was uh, he was like a little testy when it came to like foul calls yeah. he's like that's a foul yeah. that's absolutely foul you know, why are they looking at it yeah. he was leaning into his, uh, his decisions good trio well you go on Twitter because there's some good stuff right mm. there in the playoff in the postseason they're killing it NBA paint always fun it's an image let me paint the picture and let me NBA paint it for you. A father and a son sitting in a car. Son says, Dad, why is my sister's name Rose? Dad says, because your mother loves roses. Well, thanks, Dad. No problem. Play in tournament. That's his name. That's all he's thinking about. Because he about. loves it. He just, he just loves, loves it. it. He just loves the play If you guys tournament. were to have another child... <laughs> Would you name him Play In Tournament? <laughs> Sophie Play In Tournament. <laughs> oh, yes, please. Sophie for short. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Nice. There you go. <laughs> you guys only have girls, so there yeah. you go. It works. Sophie, perfect. Uh, no so- choice there. Uh, all right, NBA Paint. Wow, that's another tweet of the night for NBA Paint. They just came up on the uh, Alan, Alan Iverson uh, tiny statue. What is this? A statue for ants. Yeah, that's oh, right. Yeah. That's right. Didn't realize They're that. on one. They're on one. Uh, all right. Before we go, I'd like to remind you that if you're a Survivor fan, there was a very weird episode last night, and we're going to be breaking it down later today at 1 p.m. Eastern. No buffs. It's got its own YouTube feed, its own podcast feed. Uh, again, around 1 p.m. Eastern, we'll go live, breaking down the dumbest tribal council of all time. <laughs> One for the ages. I'll leave it at that. I'll leave it at that. It was pure insanity. I feel like JD's going to be extremely angry on today's no buffs. Maybe mm. TK as well. I can't wait. I can't wait. Also can't wait for tomorrow with the Drop Podcast. We'll be here at 10 a.m. Eastern. Now, no games on tonight. That ain't going to stop us from doing a show. We'll set up the playing games on Friday night, all the NBA news, and uh, anything else as we look forward to a very busy weekend of NBA playoffs. We can drop the postseason when we hit Saturday. It's just playoffs. Mm -hmm. Eight games on. Schedules are out, too, for the most part. We now know the order of teams. Yeah, we can go over that as well on tomorrow's Drop Podcast. Till then, Clipper Bros. You heard it here first. Have a great time. Turn up. Love you guys. Awesome. Thanks for joining us. And remember, four days, or four games, I should say, every single night in the playoffs to start it, Saturday and Sunday. Are you ready? 
Are you ready? Are you ready? <laughs> Brace the day, people.